we will post the recording to the West Falls Church uh, TSA webpage after this meeting. I'll begin by going over tonight's uh, agenda. Um, we take care of a few administrative, administrative items first, followed by it was on the agenda on the website that I sent out, but it's not included here. We're going to have a short. Um, Sorry, Brian. Holly, do you mind muting yourself? Holly, I, do you mind? Thank you. Oh. Um, followed by a, uh, a short public uh, Q&A, just limited to 10 minutes for those folks who have questions or comments but aren't able to stay until uh, the latter part of the meeting. Um, I'll then give a, uh, a brief presentation covering some of the comments that the county uh, has sent the developers in their latest concept. That's the one that you all saw last month. Um, and uh, with just a, a couple of modifications that they've made to it. Um, and since that last meeting, uh, I've received a few process related questions um, on the plan amendment. So I wanted to give a brief overview um, on the plan amendment process, explain you know, what's involved in a plan amendment and, and uh, cover the task force role in that um, a little more. Um, and then we'll then transition into both a presentation and a discussion on some of the topics that we are expecting to address in the comprehensive plan amendment. Uh, and finally, we'll cap tonight's meeting with uh, the public question and answer and comment uh, section as per usual. Um, so with that, David, I will pass it off to you for the adoption of the September meeting minutes. Um, okay. I do actually, and Paul, I don't know if you want to speak to this, my apologies. Paul did send me um, a recommended addition to the, uh, the meeting summary. I don't know if you want to speak to that for a moment, Paul. I, I wasn't able to send that out before the meeting this evening. Um, but if, okay. I was gonna say, if anybody else has any recommended changes to the meeting minutes that I sent out last week um, yeah. that you haven't sent to me, um, you can note them now. I, uh, thanks. I just simply, I sent, every, I sent it to everyone on the task force. So if they sent their email, they would have seen it. I just simply had a particular comment that I want to be a little more clear, and I would encourage anyone to actually go watch the September minutes, starting around uh, about 20 minutes into it, uh, and my comments were 23 minutes and 15 seconds into it, that I wanted to be uh, a little more clear that the community had expressed concern uh, about safety issues, particularly relating to children walking in areas without sidewalks, and I've experienced that myself. Uh, walking along Beacon and, and Kaysmont, uh, and that uh, the, the two sentences will basically be a little more clear that there were community concerns, which I share about uh, increasing the traffic, which we know will happen, and uh, walking to and from the metro with these great attractions there without the addition of putting sidewalks in a lot of these unsidewalked to use a new term uh, areas so those are just the two the two sentences i wanted to put in there to put that on the record brian you haven't actually Thank incorporated you. that yet correct i i have not but i, I, I believe yeah i was as paul noted the task force uh should have received those additions um, so i guess what maybe is proper for me to do is if everybody has looked or at least an opportunity to look at them does anybody have any objection to incorporating Paul's comments into the um, in, into the minutes, because if not, I will make a motion to approve the minutes with that incorporated. All right, I don't think I see any hands or nobody speaking up. I second. Okay, all right. So that's the motion to incorporate it with that. Um, seeing seeing nobody objecting to Paul's thing, um, is there any? Um, I'm trying to think how the best way to do that is there. I don't want everybody at all 10 people to feel like I have to put their hands up. I think the way I'm going to do it is if, um, uh, is there anybody who objects to um, approving the minutes with that it change? If so, please raise your hand or let me know. All right, not seeing anything. I'm going to say the minutes are passed then. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, David. Um, 
So as I mentioned a moment ago, we've set aside 10 minutes for community comment or uh, question and answer uh, for those members of the public that cannot attend until the end of the meeting. Um, so if you have any questions you would like to ask, uh, you can do so by opening up the participants uh, um, window. If there should be a button on the bottom right hand side of your screen. It's a silhouette of a person with three bars. You click that, um, you should see at the bottom of that participants window a uh, an icon that has a hand. You can uh, click that to raise your hand and be recognized. Um, I do want to note uh, before we start that though that um, at our last meeting there was a lot of interest uh, expressed in uh, on transportation topics, especially um, in the area surrounding the proposed development uh, that we're considering. And so we're trying to, I just want to say that we're trying to uh, focus more tonight on uh, the plan for the WMATA and the Virginia Tech sites. And at next month's meeting on November 17th, we're planning a more in depth meeting focused primarily on transportation topics. So uh, if you have questions or comments regarding those, they may be answered at that meeting or maybe that may be a more uh, appropriate place to, to um, bring them up. But. Um, hey, Ryan. Uh, I do see a hand raised by Cheryl Sim. Could you please unmute yourself and ask? Uh, I have to right. unmute her. Give me one. Oh, you have to. Okay. Yeah. All right, because she's a, not a, a panelist, right? That's okay. right, Cheryl. You are uh, unmuted. Well, well, thank you very much. And first of all, I don't want to labor this, uh, Brian, because I understand that the issues that most affect my neighborhood are going to be addressed next week. Or, or sorry, next month, but let me thank all of you task force members for your work. I think you have an enormous task on hand and those of us who don't have representation on the task force really appreciate your efforts. That noted, this is a good reminder, I think, for both the county and supervisor Faust's office that there are hundreds of households in my area that have no representation and we really appreciate the opportunity to express our concerns. And since you started holding these meetings virtually, I've listened in on all of them. And I'm concerned that there seems to be a certain expectation that the developer is going to address for our communities longstanding traffic problems that the county and VDOT have failed to address over these years, over the past, well, let's say decades. And I had a great conversation with Evan and Pam back in August. And I would like to also thank them for their efforts to address some of these issues. And just to kind of reiterate once again what Nancy McFall said last month, our area, which is bordered by Haycock to the north, Great Falls in Westmoreland to the east and west, and um, I-66 to the south, already suffers from the unbridled development of the Tyson's Corner area and the sort of uncontrolled development of Falls Church City. Our traffic problems are really very severe. Supervisor Faust's office has helped us on a number of them. And I really do want to implore the county to include our area in any transportation and, and pedestrian safety um, studies that are being done. Some of the documents that I looked at stopped at Great Falls and did not extend all the way to Westmoreland. So with that, I don't want to belabor it and take a lot of time. I just wanted to go on the record with those points. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, Brian, thank do you have anything you, do you want to respond in any way to that? Uh, I just wanted to, to thank Cheryl for coming to the meeting tonight and sharing her concerns um, and that uh, I encourage her to attend the November 17th meeting. Um, and I hope that um, you know, she can uh, participate then as well, and hopefully um, we can provide her with some some more information uh, at that time. Thank you. Now I see Ed Sarmiento. Ed, if you could do, do you have to unmute him, Brian? Okay. All right, Ed, you can go ahead. Ed, you are. Uh, Ed, you're, you are unmuted. Oh, you should be able to speak. He already No, I'm mute. You are unmuted, Ed. I think they're having an internal debate. <laughs> That's who's something to say. Well, well, now we have the hand back up. Um, and I was muted again, so I don't know. Ed, do you want do you want to speak? We unmuted you. 
Can you unmute him again, Brian? He seems to be muted. Yeah, I might be able to. And did you want to speak? Okay, to yeah, one? great, thanks. Yo, yo, first of all, uh, thanks for um, holding these meetings and thanks for working on the task force and keeping everyone informed. Uh, my two comments um, and questions are, uh, last meeting we talked about trying to do a simple summary to help people understand, you know, what to the extent is the development. Um, I think we see some of the presentations, you know, there's several, several presentations, several slides long, but um, we were hoping we would get this one simple summary to kind of make it clear in a lot of people's minds. And the second comment is, um, I know we're going to talk about the traffic in November, but will that give us enough time to actually take action um, based on whatever you show on the November meeting? Thank you, Ed. Uh, thank you, Ed. Um, we we do have a um, so, so I guess a, a couple of things uh, in response to your question. Um, because this is a uh, plan amendment study, there isn't necessarily a specific and I'll get into this a little later tonight, um, and hopefully that will provide some more clarity. Um, the task force isn't necessarily looking at a specific development that they want to um, approve or deny or recommend approval or denial on. Um, it's more about establishing guidelines for any future development that happens here. Um, because of the kind of process we're going through, which is called the site specific plan amendment process, uh, this idea was brought forth by originally by these two major property owners that we have uh, at this site, uh, Wamada and Virginia Tech, for a uh, to replan their uh, their properties adjacent to the West Falls Church Metro, Metro Station for mixed use development that includes office, commercial, uh, retail, uh, commercial office, uh, retail, multifamily, residential, and and townhouses. Um, part of what this task force will be considering is what kind of recommendations do they want to make for uh, what is included in the plan amendment. Um, so I encourage you to stick around uh, for the rest of the meeting. I think it should uh, make the, should provide some clarity on the process. There is a description on our webpage and um, and my emails uh, up here on the screen. Uh, if you can please uh, feel free to email me, and I can send you a link to that web page that kind of has a, a short description of of what the um, the the scope of what the task the plan amendment for the task force is uh, is studying. Um, and sorry, and the second part of your question in terms of the uh, transportation, uh, the transportation impact. Bob, I don't know if if you want to address that at all. Uh, Bob Bacora from FCDOT is here. Um, if, sorry, was that you, Bob? That was me. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, yes, thanks, Brian. Uh, Bob Bacora with Fairfax County Department of Transportation. The uh, meeting that we're planning for for uh, November. It is a two hour or two and a half hour, whatever, all inclusive uh, discussion on transportation. So we're gonna bring a lot of uh, our, my fellow coworkers to the meeting and we're gonna talk about the, the big topics and then uh, looking at the traffic impact analysis, analyses for the city site and also the Wilmotta and Virginia Tech site, the residential traffic administration program bicycle and pedestrian connectivity, and then looking at the uh, general areas around uh, the two sites. So um, since we're meeting in November uh, to talk about that, and we're, uh, we'll present ideas or, or concepts and some of the things that we are reviewing, but also we'll, we'll have plenty of time for you all to uh, ask us questions. And uh, there will be uh, a number of staff there that can respond to your, to your questions on that. The uh, transportation analysis is a uh, 
uh, review under a review by uh, Virginia Department of Transportation now. I believe they're about a month into the review of, uh, and it's a typically uh, it's a 90 day review process by VDOT. So by November, we hope to have some comments that we can uh, review with you on uh, what uh, VDOT is looking at from their perspective. And then we can uh, provide some information as to how mitigations might occur. So um, we might also, uh, I think as Brian will get into later, we'll have other meetings in December uh, and uh, December and January. So if there's other topics that come up regarding transportation, we, we're not gonna just limit it to November, but we'll, the primary focus for November is transportation, but we can also, also talk about it in uh, months after that. A couple months after that, that is, but at some point we, we will have to end it. So, hope that helps. Thanks, Bob. Ed, are you uh, okay with that answer for now? He's muted again. Ed, are you okay with that answer for now? Well, for the for the first part, because I remember we talked to the developers. They said a summary they would easily do. I mean, David, you were on that call yeah, too, no, right? Probably, yeah. probably this is not fair to put to Brian and everything because mm -hmm. it's probably something we should take up with Evan because with we Evan. have a conversation with him. And um, okay. maybe what we need to do is email him about that because uh, I don't know that Brian even is aware of that conversation. Oh, so, okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll follow up. That's okay. probably the ball is probably in their court rather than than the um, yeah, staffers court. Okay. Okay. And then about the yeah, and then about the traffic, it wasn't so much the concern about time to answer the questions during the meeting. It was more after you you present your results and then people digest the information and then they they're thinking, okay, this is going to impact me a lot, a little. What can I do about it? That's the kind of time uh, I was uh, more referring to. And um, th th this is Andrew Painter with Waskalucci. Um, we're working with EYA and the consortium, Hoffman and everybody. Just want to let you know, my understanding is that we are working on preparing that summary. So it's not ready right now, but it will be. Um, okay. Soon, so. Okay, great. Thank you. And I, I think what it is really getting at is once we get all this information, and this is the thing I've raised before too, we have much time between us getting it are we going to have to analyze it, get back to communities, discuss it among them, and get back to you? That's that has always been what I was concerned about, being a time that's too compacted. But um, we've discussed this before, and we'll discuss it again, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I, David, I have a, and we can, uh, if there are still some questions on this uh, later on in the meeting. We can yeah, we're going over time. I know. I, I was going to say, I I have a kind of a timeline that. Uh, things that we can, so we can address it at that time. Uh, yeah. If okay. there are still questions about it. Okay. So we'll, and I, um, I don't see any other hands up. So um, I think we can end the comment, the early comment period then. All right. So um, I just wanted to uh, uh, update the task force um, at the last meeting uh, Evan from EYA uh, presented an updated concept of their vision for the WMATA and the Virginia Tech tracks. Um, since that time, we've provided them both with some verbal and uh, the developers with some verbal and written feedback uh, on uh, the concept they prevented. Um, in response to that verbal feedback, they gave us a, a rough draft of another possible configuration that um, Satisfied some of our comments. Uh, it it uh, provided a more direct route to the Metro Rail Station um, from uh, most of the uh, what's called the transit development area. Basically, you know, most of the Wamana Virginia Tech site, the Village Pavilion, and, and some of the uh, neighborhoods across the street on Hickok Road. Um, and uh, it also uh, included more usable park space. And it was that slightly revised concept that we provided comments on. So. We just want to make the task force aware of some of the uh, larger, comprehensive, uh, more general, comprehensive plan level comments that we uh, gave them. So, as a reminder, uh, this is the concept that they had prevented, they had presented to you all uh, last month, 
And uh, Evan, hope you don't mind if I share your kind of back of the napkin uh, sketch <laughs> with the task force, just so that they know what we are making comments on. Sure, that's fine. Um, the, okay, this is the uh, slightly revised concept that we provided comments on. So um, I'll just go over those briefly. Um, many of them, uh, were, uh, many of the comments on land use uh, and design um, reference guidance found in the county's uh, transit oriented development or TOD policy. Uh, if you all recall, uh, we reviewed this uh, perhaps early this year, uh, maybe late last year, and you should all have it in your binders. Um, so we noted that the more intense development on the WMATA tract should be concentrated nearest to the metro station. And in a similar vein, we also stated that given the proximity to the metro station, uh, multifamily development uh, would be uh, the mo most appropriate form of uh, residential uh, on the tracks and townhomes should be uh, used as a transition to the um, neighboring uh, residential areas. Um, and for the townhomes that back up to the village and the pavilion, we ask them to consider how building footprints, height, uh, four-sided facades, and the treatment of the alley uh, could ensure that the townhomes are compatible with the existing community. And um, we encouraged uh, pedestrian, uh, we encouraged them to include pedestrian uh, or vehicular connectivity between the two developments if the topography works and if you all and the neighboring communities are supportive of new connections. Um, and finally, we, uh, we recommended as, uh, as is in our TOD policy that buildings should be oriented towards the street. Um, related to land use mix, um, the latest proposal that we've seen from the development team shows that this is particularly in relation to the WMATA tract, that there would be, uh, that it would be 87% residential but we encourage the development team to consider a wider mix of uses uh, or ways to activate the street frontage on the primary route through the site. And this would uh, help to create a community that's active and inhabited throughout the entire course of the day, encourage reverse commuting, and just generally maximize the benefits of being uh, located at a metro station. Um, and then also in our comments, we reiterated that uh, parks and open space would have to conform to the urban parks framework, uh, in, including uh, minimum park acreage standards. Uh, I don't know if you all recall, this is something that we briefly covered, uh, I think early this year, maybe in, in January or February before the pandemic. Um, we kind of gave a brief summary of the urban parks framework. Uh, I would be happy to send out an email to the task force to uh, for a link that includes that framework if if everyone is interested in it. Um, we also provided recommendations on the types of parks we'd like to see incorporated into the development, like a larger central green or a plaza, um, a civic plaza, and a recreational park. Uh, and lastly, we recommended that there be public art and public spaces uh, in both developments to uh, help create a sense of place. And identity. Um, and finally, we, we made some comments related to uh, circulation within the site in the grid of streets. Um, we stressed that the transit transfer areas uh, and service streets, such as the proposed uh, bus loop in front of the metro station, um, should also be pedestrian oriented. Um, and uh, we, uh, um, we stated the design of the proposed plaza in front of the Metro Rail Station will be vital for ensuring good pedestrian connectivity and wayfinding uh, between the rest of the study area and the surrounding community and the Metro Station. Um, so it should provide a, a, a visual and physical connection from the station to the rest of the site. Um, and that covers most of the general guidance that we provided to the, to the development team. Um, we've recently received some responses from them, but we're still waiting on a couple of, uh, a couple of items. Um, and we'll continue to work with them through the comprehensive planning phase and, phase and beyond, um, which kind of brings us to our next section. However, before we proceed, I just want to check 
with the task force to see if there are any questions or comments on any of the points of just. I, I have one, but I will first see if I've got any task force members. Paul, I think you've got your hand up. Can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes. Uh, what does a 24 7 community mean? If someone's, uh, you know, if you have a bunch of people living there, what exactly does it mean? I mean, I assume you don't mean people staggering out of a bar at two in the morning. Uh, <laughs> at least I hope you don't. <laughs> no, no, that's not what we mean. You know, there are, we wanted to make sure that it's active at all points during the day. So, you know, we don't want to necessarily uh, uh, plan for a development that is empty for half of the daytime um, or is, uh, you know, empty in the you know, early evening. So that there's, you know, consistent kind of uh, activity throughout the street during the times when you would expect it. Okay, so that's not 24 seven. That's like maybe, I don't know, 17 seven. I mean, I, the question that immediately came to my, my mind is what's going on at four in the morning? <laughs> well, I guess, you know, I, you would say 24 seven because it, in a case like this, because, um, you know, in some downtown areas that are exclusively office, people don't live there and they, you know, mm -hmm. there's, they're, they're completely empty throughout the, you know, throughout the evening. Um, you know, no one in the buildings, no one on the streets. Uh, and so that's what we mean by 24 seven. Right. But those areas aren't 87% residential. Those are 0% residential. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, I was just, you know, the, the immediate thing that just got to me and, you know, uh, it's just that I don't want, I don't want, I want, certainly want people living there 24 seven, but there's a certain amount of activity uh, that I think at three in the morning that I would just prefer to be nothing other than people in their homes. But I guess that's consistent with what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. We're just talking about having mixed use. Okay. Thank you. Okay, do we have anybody else from the task force? I don't think so. Um, I, uh, Paul, why don't you take your hand down so we don't um, think it's up first, unless you've got a second question. Um, I just wanted to know, as either this short uh, PowerPoint here, uh, a slide presentation going to be available on the, um, on the web page or, or your actual comments, going to be, um, I don't know how long they actually are, since this is a compact version. That's a question. Uh, Brian. Yeah, this this will be on the web page. Um, if the task force is interested in them, I'm, I'm happy to distribute the comments to the task force. I will say they okay. do they do include um, comments that aren't necessarily appropriate to the comprehensive planning stage of things, but they're just items that we wanted to recognize early, early on, as, as early on as possible. And so, you know, we gave those to the, um, to the developers as well, but they're just kind of, they're more granular comments that aren't, like I said, aren't relevant to things that would be included in the comprehensive plan. Okay, Brian, do you have any problem? Do you think it more appropriate to distribute it only to the task force rather than put it on the web page? And do you have any problem if anybody on the task force gets it? distributing it any further I mean, because you may not want it to go to have a wide circulation then i i don't i don't have a problem with anybody in the task force distributing it further okay so how do you want to do this you want to put it on the web page or do you want to just email it to the task force um i think it's it's it's, it's maybe uh makes more sense to people who are a little more acquainted with the project and so i think it may lead to some confusion if we post it on the web page with, you know, without the context of, you know, everything we've been discussing uh, here at these task force meetings. So I, I think it, you know, would probably be better just to uh, circulate it with amongst the task force. And okay. Okay. Thank you. Stephanie, I see you got your hand up. Why don't you, uh, go ahead. thank you, go ahead. Yeah, so does this mean that the last iteration of the development plan that we saw from Evan should not be distributed because there are going to be major changes to it based on your comments. So we, we're still in the process. So, and actually, I think this, I'll speak a little bit to this in a, in a minute, but, 
you know, the, the major thing that I think the task force should be really be focusing on moving forward is the plan amendment, not as much as the concepts. The, the concepts are important um, because they help to inform what's going into the plan amendment. But um, it's, I, I think that, that, that we all should remember that the task force isn't considering the concepts, they're considering the plan amendment. So you know, the, the, whatever the final, what is finally approved at, at zoning may not be exactly what you, what we see here at this point. Okay. Um, Brian, isn't it true that um, Evan's last uh, presentation is actually on the web page? Is it not from uh, attached to the last meetings materials it, or not? It is. Yes, it is on the web page uh, under the uh, the previous meeting under his presentation. So, Stephanie, anybody could get it if somebody in your organization wants to see it. They could just be directed to that anyway. Okay, any more from you, Stephanie? Okay, let's see if we got anybody else. I don't think so. Stephanie, why don't you put your hand down so we don't have any confusion? And then, um, Brian, I guess you want to go on to another thing. Yeah, I just want to take this opportunity to talk about the comprehensive uh, plan generally and its role in land development and also to cover the task force's role in the comprehensive plan amendment. I've, I've received a couple of questions uh, since the last uh, meeting um, related to this, so I just uh, wanted to set aside a few minutes to, uh, to talk about that. Um, so I'd like to cover kind of once more what exactly a plan amendment is and, and what it means. So, uh, and in particular, this plan amendment. So because this planning study was born out of the site-specific plan amendment process or SSPA, it's a little different from some of the other planning studies that we have in Fairfax County. Um, I know in, in some ways it seems more like an application uh, because there are property owners and developers involved However, I think it's important that we keep in mind that while the ideas that were originally put forth by Virginia Tech uh, and WMATA were the impetus of this planning study and they guided the scope of the Board of Supervisors authorization, um, it's ultimately the board's planning study. And because of that, we're not bound by the initial proposals that WMATA and Virginia Tech um, put forth. Um, but by the scope of the board's authorization. So I, I just wanted to make that clear. I know in the past that there were some questions as to whether the developers would have to amend an application if they diverged from their initial proposal. Uh, they won't have to because that was, it's what we call a nomination. Like I said, it's an idea that was put forth. It wasn't, it's not considered an application. Um, Second, uh, it's important to recall that the plan amendment is the first part of reconsidering how the land here um, could be used, and it paves the way for an eventual zoning application, which would also go before the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors. Um, so when county staff, the Planning Commission, and the Board of Supervisors are reviewing zoning applications, Part of what they're looking at is whether the comprehensive plan guidance supports the proposal in that zoning application. In that sense, the more general guidelines in the comprehensive plan affect the ultimate more granular details found in those zoning applications. Um, so far, the task force has seen some fairly developed concepts prevented by some fairly uh, detailed concepts uh, prevent, presented by the developers and that's one of the advantages, I'd say, of the site-specific plan amendment process, that we get to work hand-in-hand -hand with developers and property owners that already have an idea about what they would like to develop. And by doing so, we're able to tailor our plan amendments to a more defined vision. Um, that being said, the development concepts provided so far um, help to inform the comprehensive plan, but they will not ultimately be a part of the comprehensive plan. Uh, so these more detailed concepts of features showing like uh, building placements, um, for example, are more akin to what you would see in those zoning applications. So because of that, I actually kind of wanted to use this, me this uh, meeting to pivot um, a little bit away from those development concepts that we've seen in the past and towards the comprehensive plan amendment. 
Um, that doesn't mean forget about them. The ideas that we've seen and that we've talked about in those concepts will still be important. As I said before, they'll ultimately be incorporated into a, a draft plan amendment for the TSA. Um, and that, that's kind of the next part of the meeting is what, um, what, do, what kind of topics does the uh, plan address? What can we expect to see and discuss about the, the draft plan amendment and what can be found in the comprehensive plan? Um, and then I want to speak a little bit to the task force's role and, and how um, and you know what your part is in all of this. Um, so the, your role is to provide guidance to us, county staff, um, the planning commission, and the board of supervisors. Um, you've already been doing this informally by providing us uh, uh, comments and your feedback at these monthly meetings. Um, however, you will also start to provide some more formal guidance um, to us over the next couple of months, the next couple of meetings. Um, and that's really going to start, it's going to start in some, some part tonight, but it's really going to start once uh, you have some draft, a draft plan amendment in front of you. And so uh, we staff are, uh, are putting together some uh, a draft plan amendment. Um, we've already written some language that's being reviewed right now. Um, and it's being reviewed internally right now. And uh, this is what the task force will review and provide recommendations on. Um, so that's um, that's what you know the planning commission and the board of supervisors ultimately is making a recommendation in the case of the planning commission and a decision in the case of the board of supervisors that's that's ultimately what they are considering not the concepts that we've been seeing and so that's that's go that's the focus of the task force really moving forward so um uh so as we review the draft text uh, which I'll, I'll go over a timeline here in a moment we're uh, we're planning on giving that to you uh, just before the next meeting, but really spending December and, and January digging into the details of that. Um, as you review the draft text that uh, that we provide you, um, the, the task force has uh, a few ways of, well, they, they have one real way, you all have one real way of making recommendations. And you can either, if you choose to do so, um, vote to endorse whatever the draft is that we provide to you. You can also uh, propose uh, edits to the, the the text that we provide you. And, and the way that um, you do that is, you know, you, members of the task force, have a discussion. Somebody proposes an edit. Uh, you all have a discussion about it. And, you know, you you vote as to whether you would like to see that included in the uh, draft plan in the text or not. Um, it is our intention, uh, county staff, that um, you know we we want to uh, arrive uh, arrive at kind of a. It's preferable that we arrive at a unanimous decision where everybody in the task force and um, and we and, and DPD are all in agreement. Um, Sometimes that doesn't happen. So you know, you you may agree with some of what we what we provide you. You may agree with a lot of what we provide you, but there are still some things that uh, um, that you all have a difference of opinion on. And uh, you know, we we try to meet you, but sometimes uh, you know there are, there are, you know, for example, board adopted policies that we can't necessarily ignore. Um, that in in those cases, you know, we might end up with a staff recommendation and a task force recommendation and both of those would go to the planning commission and to the board um, but how you know, as i said how it will work is you all will consider individual parts of the test text you vote to whether you approve of what we've drafted or, or vote to make a change we will make uh, a, a change and come back to you with it with your uh, changes incorporated that you've, uh, you know, assuming the majority of the task force supports them with those changes incorporated. Um, and at the end of this, uh, the task force will vote to uh, on 
those accumulated recommendations as to whether they uh, want to recommend to the Planning Commission and to the Board of Supervisors to approve of the plan amendment or to disapprove of the plan amendment. So that is kind of the, the ultimate product of the task force. Um, and uh, if there are individual task force members that feel that their uh, views aren't necessarily encapsulated by the task force's recommendation, um, they may choose to send individual letters to the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors uh, outlining their position. Um, and then uh, just briefly, we have a we have a timeline here. So, um, you know, we are here kind of closer to the beginning, the October 2020 uh, meeting uh, next month. Um, we are we have our big transportation discussion in November, um, and we are going to provide you with draft plan text. We'll spend a, we're expecting to spend a little bit of that meeting, you know, not much time, just kind of introducing it to you. Um, and then in December, we uh, are really expecting to uh, dig into that draft plan text. And part of the discussion we want to have tonight is, um, you know, we think that. Uh, we don't we don't want to have one meeting and then have everybody kind of uh, forget what we talked about. Um, and so, you know, we're we're going to propose that we have two December meetings. Um, and, you know, there's there's no date decided on that yet, and we'll have to have a discussion to see what dates people are available if, if they're available for uh, an earlier December meeting. Um, uh, and with you know, uh, the goal of uh, in our January meeting, having gone through those two December meetings, gotten feedback from you, uh, incorporating it into our draft, um, you know, uh, we're aiming to uh, um, finalize the draft comprehensive plan text in January. Um, you know, we're, we're expecting to have uh, approval of, of VDOT uh, uh, on the WMATA and Virginia Tech traffic study by that point. Of course, I know that's what everybody is um, is uh, concerned with, um, which would um, lead us to a planning commission and board, uh, board of supervisors hearing uh, in the spring of 2021. Um, and with that, before we move on, uh, I want to open it up to, for questions. Um, Anybody on the task force? I have a couple, but I will recognize other people first. And I, I do actually want to say, you know, I, I know after that, uh, you've mentioned this before, David, and, and we said the last meeting, we were waiting on some uh, some clarity on some of the transportation timeline stuff. Uh, we we have a we have kind of a, a, a guide that we're putting together that includes the, these uh, this timeline in terms of, you know, how uh, includes a lot of the information that I've presented tonight, but in written form, um, uh, and it goes into a little more, a little more detail. Um, so we will be providing that to the task force shortly. So will that have everything basically that you have just showed here in this presentation? Yeah, it yeah it will. Uh, everything that I have I've said to you tonight will be. Uh, Will be included in that. Okay, that's always important to me and maybe to others too. Otherwise, I'm just taking notes on everything that's up on the screen. So it's good to be able to have a reference. So we'll be able to get that in about when? Do you, would you say? I think in the next in the next week we can have. Okay. That. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, as to transportation, so VDOT has 90 days to review. And they usually get their initial comments out in 45 days, which means probably from the next two weeks as I, or a week or something, as I recall, given that I believe it was submitted to VDOT right before the last meeting, which is five weeks ago. So you may have the initial ones by um, our November meeting, but if they've got 90 days, I don't understand what happens after the initial ones. What I'm really trying to get at is final V dot comments may not come in for 90 days, and that's December sometime. From the original. Yeah, I, I can explain that. So, um, mm -hmm. so when when uh, V dot submits their 
when the traffic studies are submitted to VDOT for review, uh, they have 90 days to total process. The comments may come back within 45 to 60 days. So we're anticipating that comments might come back to us at the end of October or the beginning of November. So hopefully we'll have something to present in November. Um, when the comments come in, uh, the uh, applicants and uh, their traffic consultant, Grove Slade, have the opportunity to provide responses to those comments and they have to resubmit the uh, the traffic impact analysis for another review by VDOT that answers the questions that they had, the comments they had, and how does it change the traffic analysis. That's when they have the other opportunity to review uh, the, 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 the next iteration of the document. So that's why I put uh, January 2021 as the approval by WMATA, by VDOT of the WMATA and Virginia Tech traffic studies. Thinking that the, the applications, Grove Slate, the applicant, uh, Grove Slate, EYA, has about 30 days to turn back in the, once they get the comments, they have 30 days to resubmit the traffic study for review. So that's a month right there. So that puts us in like, let's say middle of December. So. VDOT still has the time, and given that it's going to be in the holidays, um, I'm thinking sometime in January, don't know when, so that's why I put possible of when we might get comments back. So between September and January, it's a little bit longer than 90 days, but um, because of the, the COVID, there's a little bit time delay with it, but in general, uh, we use like a 90 day time frame. That is something that VDOT has given us. So Virginia Tech, uh, and WMATA have one traffic study. There's also the Route 7 Chestnut Street intersection that's under review, and also the City of Falls Church traffic study. So it's I built that into the timeline here that Brian presented, so you know when the other studies are going to be uh, possibly uh, reviewed and uh, approved. The Route 7 Chestnut Street study does have to go to Richmond, uh, to the central office there because of that's an innovative intersection and Route 7 is a uh, road of regional significance. So the state engineer in Richmond has to review that. I think that's maybe a two to three month process. We might have a resolution on that in February. So that doesn't in inform uh, directly the WMATA and Virginia Tech traffic studies, but it might in impact uh, how the uh, traffic study is responding to uh, all the intersections in the WMATA Virginia Tech traffic study, which includes the Chestnut Street and Route 7 intersection. So it's there, there's basically five studies out there reviewing traffic, uh, uh, traffic and signals. So, but these are the these are the bigger uh, studies here that are listed. Thank you, Bob. Uh, what, this, what this occurs to me is there's a little bit of a disconnect by, between this rather extended period for getting all these studies finished and when you, Brian, seem to be anticipating that we're going to you know, vote on plan text amendment and all that. I mean, some of this stuff may still be up in the air while we're writing this. And if I'm going to, or anybody else uh, representing their communities, is going to try to hold any kind of meetings or get feedback based on based on traffic, which for some of us is the major issue. We may be doing that either doing it prematurely because we don't have all the answers yet, or risking waiting too late because um, we're about to wait and finish things up. So, can you address that? Yeah. So let me so let me just add a little bit something more on the the traffic studies. If, if everything works well, we, the timing might be that we're getting all the final resolution and VDOT accepts the letter in January. So whenever the meeting is in January, you'll have final resolution of, the, of that traffic impact analysis. That will uh, help us when we start presenting with uh, at, right, whenever a future community meeting is or the planning commission board of supervisors. They also want to hear what the results were of the traffic study. If there is a, uh, a delay in the, the, the traffic studies, it's because they, their traffic studies are very complicated and there may be like a lot of comments or uh, 
the comments that come back from VDOT, they are coming from engineers, traffic engineers. They're not necessarily related to like uh, transportation planning. They're looking at what the methodology was. Why did you use that model versus this model or this analysis rather than that analysis? How do you explain that? So I don't know what's going to come out of it because I haven't seen the comments yet. No, no one has seen the comments yet, but when we have those, we will be able to pick which uh, comments that we can uh, bring forward to the task force. Uh, other comments that are related to the modeling, the synchro analysis, or well, I'm talking a lot of jargon here, it's probably too technical to review, but if you want to hear about what that technical review is, we can also talk to you about that as well. So I'll talk with you all about that too. Okay. So at, Bob, at, at the November meeting. So okay. So Bob, I think what you're saying is that we ought to get everything, the task force ought to get everything that it's really capable of of digesting out of transportation in the initial comments rather than having to wait right. for the following. Right. The, the at the November meeting we might get a, enough of the substantive comments on the traffic impact analysis that you'll have an idea of what uh, VDOT is looking for and uh, how the applicants or, or EYA and Hoffman and uh, Rushmark have to respond with their traffic consultants to satisfy, satisfy VDOT's concerns. And remember, VDOT maintains the roads in the county. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have to abide by their rules on that. And, and David, I also kind of want to make sure I'm understanding uh, your question completely. Part of what it sounds like your concern is is that without having first seen the results of the traffic uh, the traffic analysis how will you know uh, how to review the comprehensive draft comprehensive plan language is is that kind of what you're getting at well partly and also how do i go out to my community with you know with the information with all the answers to, to information i mean it's one thing to go out to the community saying would you like to see a light there would you like to see some measure there or how do you feel about a lot of traffic but if we don't have final results and and mitigation all that that's gone through vdot so that we know what is proposed i'm just wondering if that makes it premature to um to really reach out to the community i mean i could do it more than once but it would seem to me i'd want to give them and others on the test course might want to give them the complete information. I see. Okay. I, so see, I just, can, just putting that in your ear. I mean, we, we can discuss how long we, I mean, I know this has been stretched out a long time already, but this is the part that's going to matter to a lot of us. So, yeah, which, you know, we, of course, understand and is, is, you know, why, why we're still, uh, why we're still doing this. Okay. Could I uh -huh. a couple of, uh, go ahead and finish? I've got a couple other things if I can. Uh, I, I was just going to say, you know, if if your concern was in part related to, you know, uh, how you, know, you all would kind of uh, review and provide feedback on a, any draft comprehensive plan text, I think we're going to go over that a little bit tonight. You, you know, I, if, from your concerns related to transportation and, and traffic uh, uh, in the area. Um, I th most of the comprehensive, most of what we'd expect to see in the comprehensive plan um, won't necessarily, you know, really be affected by the results of the traffic impact analysis. It covers lots of areas that um, that, that just aren't directly related to okay. Um, okay. the traffic study. I'm going to um, ask Cheryl, I see she's got her hands, hand up, and before I go into anything else, I don't want to dominate this discussion, so Cheryl, um, I see you've unmuted yourself, so could you go ahead? Sure, thank you. Bob, I have a question for you, and it's a theoretical question. Is your goal the same as what I think our goal is? And our goal is if the traffic with the addition of the plans is equal to or better than what we have today, I mean, is that your goal? Because our goal is to save the Metro. Our goal is to save the West Falls Church Metro, keep it open all the hours that it's supposed to be open. <laughs> is your goal the same? I mean, all we want is traffic that is no worse than it is today. So perhaps I, the question I should ask is, what is your goal for, for yes, the so 
Okay, so just really quickly, the, the goal of our traffic analysis is to look at the traffic on uh, the roads. And whenever there's a comp plan amendment, VDOT wants to know how much of an impact does all this new development have on the streets. Uh, our traffic analysis does not look into Metro, but uh, we are going to keep Metro alive. It's going to stay, it's gonna remain here at this location. We are not planning to change that. So we're looking at more the pedestrian activity, the bicycle activity, and then the vehicle activity. Uh, VDOT is concerned with more, more about the vehicles and the signals and signal timing and where a new signal might be needed. So they're operating, as does the county, that what we're looking for is a level of service D. So that means um, in the, the time of delay, it's I think it's between 55 and 80 seconds at a signal that that is a, uh, is a policy that the county has and it's a policy that VDOT also has. And, so, and, we know, and we know that some of our intersections are worse than that today. That, so that's right. If, yeah, if that's that's right. I mean, if somebody wants A, B, or C, they have to move outside of Dulles, right? They have to move out to Sterling. So if we get D, we're better off than are in most cases. And you are going to help make sure that, that happens. Right, and that and that comes with mitigation. So whatever the mitigations are proposed by Evans team and Barov Slade, that's something that VDOT has to review and approve before they give the go-ahead on the traffic analysis. So if that LOSD or uh, at in some instances an LOSE might work, we have to we have to look to see what the mitigations that they are proposing is that reasonable to mitigate those concerns. Yes, there might be intersections, and uh, I think I know which one you might be talking about. That is probably operating at a, at a worse condition today. So what can they do to mitigate that? So that's something that has to be evaluated. And it's not just the uh, uh, intersections that are right immediate to the area, but it's also how they work within the entire network. And uh, how, how Whatever is happening here, as far as the the amount of vehicle trips that are generated from these three sites, how does that work with the fabric of the entire uh, of the regional network in this area? So that's something that they're looking at. So we're trying to now I'll, I'll, I can get into this more in in November as to how, the kinds of things we look at at uh, at a traffic impact analysis. So. Uh, so you're getting like a taste of what we're, we're going to talk about next month, but it's um, you're looking for the roads that work that you can still actually get out on to and have a reasonable wait time at a traffic signal. That's something that we're still looking for as well. So um, when there's other problems related to like um, uh, side streets or the other streets that are around, there's other programs within the county that can help address that too. So bicycle and pedestrian connectivity, we're looking to see where we where uh, we can recommend in the comp plan uh, additional uh, bicycle and pedestrian facilities to connect this new development to the larger community. So, um, I mean, just a quick finish. Yeah. I have been to every meeting since the very first meeting. I have not missed one. I have learned to trust you. I have learned to trust what you say, what you tell us. And I think that you are on the same page that we're on. We just wanna make sure that everything is good and nothing gets worse. And I think that's what you're trying to do. Right, right. That that's, that's what we're trying to do is we don't want the, to make the roads worse. So when new developments like this come in, uh, they should, be able to mitigate the uh, intersections and the roads uh, so they're not worse than they uh, started with. Uh, that is something that uh, the county and also VDOT are concerned about. We're looking at safety as well, so our incidents are safety prevent, incident prevention with safety. So um, these developments, so 
my role is I'm uh, reviewing and advising, and these are and coming to conclusions. And that uh, when we talk about the results of the the traffic impact analysis, we'll talk about um, what uh, the mitigations are being proposed and how it's going to work. So. Um, they just submitted their traffic analysis, so it's, it's now to this point where we actually actually can start showing what what the uh, what they analyzed and what the results are. Thank you. By the way, we're, we're getting we're getting there. You're on this committee, right? So so we're getting there. Yeah. So it, it may it you know I remember we started this process back in January 2019, but we're getting there. So. Hopefully that helps out. Thank you again. Sure. David looks like you're muted. Uh, David? You're muted. It looked like you were speaking for a moment. I'm sorry. Yes, I was muted. Uh, I was going to say, uh, first I was going to ask, is there anybody else on the task force? Uh, who has a question, but I do not see any hands raised. And while I have a couple, I think that um, I will just defer them. I think you've gone, we've gone over what you wanted to allocate to this. So at the end of the meeting, I would like to to, to raise them, but I'll I'll let you proceed. I think. You know, I think I think we probably have a little bit of a little bit of extra time. Um, All right. If if you want to go, if it's more appropriate to address right now. If it's okay, it shouldn't take too long. Timeline. First of all, what, um, when is this community meeting supposed to be? The last time I think you said it would be late October, early November. I think I saw that in my notes or something, but uh, we're kind of already there. So, yeah. So it's uh, as it says in the in the timeline here. It's to be determined. Um, that was when we were um, initially expecting to have uh, draft plan language to you sooner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I think right now we would probably be, um, you know, like I said, we're we're still in, it's discussing it uh, internally, um, but uh, you know, right now I, I guess my expectation might be uh, December, but that's something that's that's not determined yet. Okay, I just wanted a rough idea, and the other thing, uh, um, I'm a little curious about. Um, uh, maybe we need to go back to your first slide. Let me see if I can put this right. All right, there's the plan amendment, but then, but as you were saying, this just gives the guidance. And then what you've got is an actual, here you are, eventual zoning application. And I'm not sure I quite understood that because I always thought, but I mean, any zoning application arguably ought to be conformed with the plan, right? Yeah, that's that's exactly right, and that's what I, I was trying to make clear earlier, and I apologize if I didn't. Well, um, you sort of did because you said the check just to make sure that it does. But I guess what I mean is that it's not a, it's not a zoning application in the sense that one needs to change anything. It's simply an application to build what the developers want to build under the under the new revised plan. Um, I guess it's. Um... It's still, I guess, wouldn't I wouldn't say it's it's an application in in that sense because you know the they aren't the the developers aren't the ones you know handing you all their preferred plan language. Um, they are presenting con, you know they presented concepts that they would like the plan to reflect, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately uh, there is more latitude on the county's side on the, on the um, you know planning commission on the board of supervisors side in terms on, on the task forces side in terms of what is you know in uh, what is in the plan amendment uh, keeping in mind though that you know their kind of originally was the impetus for this we do have developers you know on board with a specific idea in mind that we're trying to be responsive to in this case. Well, I'm, I'm maybe not making myself clear, but is there any difference between what you're referring to here as an eventual zoning application and an application that you would get anywhere where a developer filed an application to build something where it was by right? Um, so, I guess, uh, 
it just I guess I want to be clear when um, when when something I guess is considered by right, it usually means that they don't require a zoning application. Um, but uh, you know, in in this case, you know, they're expecting I think to file a, a rezoning, for example. So the current zoning district that the um, that the tracks are in maybe wouldn't support what they are seeking to do. So that's why it's not necessarily considered by right. That's why you know, there would have to be a, a zoning application. So you're saying um, you're saying if let, let's suppose we all agree to amend the comprehensive plan in whatever way you're you're developing this. So the plan is amended, but the zoning has not been changed. Is that what you're saying? Somebody actually has to change the zoning? Because I don't think that was ever clear to me and I've always tried to understand how this works. That that's correct. So the zoning ordinance is one of the tools for implementing the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan is is a guide, mm -hmm. um, and so the zoning ordinance uh, is you know like I said that that is uh, how kind of the comprehensive plan is is realized. Um, so so that's why we are going through this replanning effort first, mm -hmm. because in this case, you know, Wamada and Virginia Tech looked at Fairfax County's comprehensive plan. They looked at their property. You know, we want to do this here. The comprehensive plan doesn't support that. So, right. you know, we could file a zoning application, mm -hmm. and it probably, you know, it wouldn't get approved because there's no support in the comprehensive plan. Right. That much I get. Sure. What what and I so don't. That's get... why we're going through this part. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So so then the p amendment is filed, and so the next thing that happens is. What uh, the the developers come in and file a zoning application asking to change the zoning, and then after that they actually file a development application for the particular development they wish to build, or is that all the same thing? Brian, do you want me to? Yeah, you can go ahead, Andrew. So, um, yeah, I mean, typically whenever we file, we represent a lot of developers of property owners, and whenever we file for a rezoning. Um, the number one criteria that the Board of Supervisors evaluates is whether or not the proposed rezoning is in harmony with the comprehensive plan. So in this case, as Brian said, and, and, and David, I think you get to, um, mm -hmm. you know, doing something other than what's out there today uh, would require a comprehensive plan amendment. Yeah, that part is easy. I think we all yeah, understand that. Right. So after the board adopts the comprehensive plan, the next step would be for, you know, logically would be for the um, developer then to come in and file a request for a rezoning. Um, and that request for the rezoning, depending on what zoning district you're in, would be a rezoning concept development plan, final development plan. Once that gets approved, then you move to your site plan and, you know, site plan process, which is administratively approved. And then mm -hmm. you can get your building permit and you start building. Um, All right. Okay. Part of the reason I'm raising this, and it's way ahead of time, of course, is I guess I was under the impression and it was not correct that once the plan was changed uh anybody could come in eya and everybody could just come in and file an application and it would be conforming to the zoning but there's no zoning change yet so where exactly what is the public the opportunity for public participation after this present opportunity regarding whether you amend the, the comprehensive plan is the is is there actually any substantial Opportunity for the public to um, uh, to provide um, feedback in in the in the zoning application. I had always assumed no, there wouldn't be really because it would be by right, but it's not yet by right because it hasn't been rezoned. Yeah, no, no. It's a, the 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 rezoning process is a year long, at least a year long process, nine months to a year or longer. It includes uh, a minimum of two public hearings, duly advertised uh, before the planning commission. And then a second and final public hearing before the board of supervisors. Um, during that process, there would undoubtedly be community meetings. Um, and you know, it's interesting because in this case, and this is kind of unlike other um, comprehensive plan amendments. In other comprehensive plan amendments, you don't really have a developer that's here that's providing sort of free ideas about what they would like to see, and then everyone's kind of responding. Um, usually, it's kind of the staff sort of leading the process and everything like that. But in this case. Um, the consortium that's controlling these three sites has come up with different proposals and ideas just to sort of get everyone's gel and juices flowing. But those ideas are not engineered. Um, they're not, not, they're not really detailed. We don't know what the skin of the buildings is going to be or anything like that. 
Um, mm -hmm. but the comprehensive plan would reflect more broad scale language like there shall be wayfinding signage or there shall be a direct connection to metro rail or right. mm -hmm. this generally be this range. Uh, and this is what the land usage should be. So very broad goals, um, which I think is what Brian and staff are probably going to present to you next month or the, and the month after. Then when you get okay. to zoning, you're getting to the very specifics about how you implement that broad vision. So, you know, the comprehensive plan says you shall have a minimum of X percent residential. Okay, well, now we're talking about this many specific units being filed for a specific application. The mm -hmm. plan says you shall have wayfinding signs. Well, these are the plans that show you exactly where the wayfinding signs are going to be. And staff would then evaluate the rezoning against the comprehensive plan's broader vision text to see if the two of them match up. Uh, I think I get that. What I'm still not quite clear on is whether after the comprehensive plan is amended, assuming it is amendment, we're talking about more than one application. Is there an application to change the zoning in which there is apparently uh, a year long process and opportunities for the public to comment, followed by an actual application to build this or, or is all of it wrapped up into one thing? So, yeah, so it's, it's the comprehensive plan and then. You know, typically the rezoning mm -hmm. has the public hearings. It's a discretionary approval by the board of supervisors. So there mm -hmm. is a, a, a major public input process. All right. Okay. After that, you go to your building permits and that's administratively approved. So after this, the major public input process in evaluating the details of everything and public comment comes with the rezoning application. But the board of supervisors and the planning commission will be looking primarily as to whether or not this, this, the rezoning application is consistent with the comprehensive plan, the new comprehensive plan guidance. So actually, even though a lot of people might come in and, you know, oppose the rezoning, am I correct that the, that basically, the, basically once the plan is amended, um, there really isn't a lot of opportunity to, to, to really be effective in any opposition? I don't know if I would characterize it that way. Um, you know, the, the, there is a just like every application that comes forward, there is an opportunity for public participation that's guaranteed by law, and it's, it's okay. similar across the board. So, um, I, I have to think, and I don't want to speak for anyone on the board of the planning commission, but certainly community impact and input is extremely important. And it is okay. To, well, this is a step I think I'd missed, and I may have even misled other people, even on the task force, and how I characterize this. Previously, because it was always my understanding that any input anybody in the communities want to have have would have to be directed to the plan amendment. And once it was amended, we wouldn't get to do very much except, you know, make comments on, you know, I don't know, but the, you know, minor kinds of things, you know, landscaping and stuff like that. But it seems there's actually a bigger opportunity to have more serious input. If that comes to that. Yeah, Brian. I was going to say, but, you know, David, this, as, as both Andrew and I said earlier, you know, again, part of the board's decision in, in approving or disapproving an application is, you know, whether the application is in harmony with the plan. So it's important mm -hmm. that we, you know, have everybody's input at this stage as well. Sure. And I'm not, I'm, believe me, I'm not, I'm not questioning this stage at all. It's, I'm not sure, I'm trying to figure out the significance of the other stages and, and in particular the degree to which developers can do something essentially by right or do something which people still have a a, a, a um a say in expressing their opinion of but i'm i'm beating this over the head now you and it, it is obviously all in the future i see that both paul and paul has his hand up and i don't know if cheryl's got it up again so i i i'm going to cut off I, I found out all i need to know for now can we continue this? Can I call on task force members? Yeah, yeah, of course. Paul? Paul can you, can uh, yeah, thank you. I, I've had a question for a while what the term by right means. To me, when I hear the term, by what? You've cut off a little bit. I want to do something that they, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's say, well, putting aside the plan amendment, let's say WMATA just wants to do something by right tomorrow. Does that mean that they can break ground tomorrow, or does that mean they have to just have a lower level approval from the county? Um, let me just say, give about 10 seconds of that, and I'll turn it over to somebody.
who has like maybe John Allfeld or somebody who's got a better way of expressing this. But, but the, take it away from Mulvada a second. Suppose you've got a residential tract that's zoned R4. If somebody decides they want to build four houses there, it's basically a done deal. I mean, I mean, there's very little I think you can, you know, that citizens can do. They can't really object to it because it fits the zoning. Uh, you know, right. as to Wamada, I think the same thing would be true. They could build the things the, the things they're authorized to build now. Am I correct? You'd have to file some sort of an application, but it certainly would not have to be to rezone. It would just be an application, a development application or something, and the public would have very little to say about it if all of this stuff was was consistent with the current zoning. Right. Well, that that's my that's my question. What is it? I just try to want to know the baseline, and I don't think anyone's really thinking that they're going to do anything by right. But what approvals do they need if they just do what they can do by right? Yeah, I, I wonder, John Olfelder. I see you were here. Could you could, can you weigh in on this at all? Um, thank the you. The, the point is, if it's a, as, as you use the example of an R four property. If somebody comes in with an application for four houses, then it becomes an administrative review. In other words, they just uh, they, they review it to make sure that it's consistent with what you need to do uh, to build four houses on that R4 lot. Uh, it doesn't have any planning commission or board uh, role at all. So it's, it's the difference between an administrative straightforward review make sure that they've uh, crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's in terms of uh, their plans for the site, but they don't have to go through a public approval process. Right, but, okay, so one of the things I've sometimes heard is, oh, oh they can do it by right, but what they can do by right, and I forget exactly what, is far below what they, need, what they could do, what they would require a plan amendment for, is that correct? The, the, I think the, I think it would be fair to argue that the reason they want the plan amendment is that they can do more with this site than they could under the current comprehensive plan language uh, at, at that site. That they had, and second of all, uh, that the original plan language was uh, developed some time ago, and it's really not uh, in keeping with uh, where the development world has gone, particularly for these transit station areas in, in terms of both the county's uh, view of the TSAs and how the WMATA and other developers have been uh, working uh, on redeveloping TSAs. Okay. Okay, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Paul, you're okay with that? Yes. Okay. Um, Cheryl, do you have your hand up again, I think? I do, just a really quick thing. Um, We've been at this for a very long time. As a matter of fact, I think the first meeting was actually two years ago in November, way back when, before even the formal meeting started. I think that Fairfax County has heard a tremendous amount of what the, the task force has said because Brian just gave us a whole list of things that they've included um, it, requesting the developers to do. so. I just think that I understand the details that you and Paul are trying to get into, but I just want to say that I honestly think that Fairfax County has heard us already, and they've already included a tremendous amount of what the task force is looking for in their requirements for the plan. So I just want to thank them. Um, David. Um, yes, Andrew. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, I, or not interrupt, but um, just to add on to one thing. It's okay. Mm -hmm. the, the buy right. Um, so it's right. Um, so the buy right, as far as the baseline density on the WMATA site, that site today is zoned to the R30 zoning district, which means it's basically 30 dwelling units per acre. Um, you multiply that by the base acreage, and that is the number of homes that could theoretically be built as a matter of right without having to go through a legislative discretionary process before the planning commission and the board of supervisors. And I think, and I, I, I'm not I, not a good guy at math and I should be, but I think that that's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 680, 700 homes or something like that. Um, uh, and there there would be no public input uh, or uh, proffered commitments or anything like that. So just wanted to set that as sort of the baseline. On right, the that would be my understanding, yes, sure. Thank you, and thank you, Cheryl, also. 
All right. I am I am sorry if I've caused this to drag on a lot longer. It always seems to be important to understand procedure, though. So, Brian, why don't you? I don't see any other hands up. Do you want to just go up? Go ahead with whatever, whatever you've got next. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I mean, the whole reason Actually, I, I do have I, Paul, I'm sorry, do you have your Paul? Sorry. You? you yeah, I, I do have a follow up. Just have to say, Paul said, uh, we're still waiting for a lot of things about traffic safety. We haven't heard about those things about traffic safety. We have people coming in here saying their children are a danger. So I do appreciate. Well, I do agree that, and appreciate the work that's been done to date. Uh, I don't agree that we are even close to having the information that we need to be able to uh, uh, come to a conclusion, and that there's a lot of traffic, uh, a traffic uh, relating to what's going on with the latency, but there's also a lot of traffic relating to uh, to uh, safety that has not even been close to being addressed yet. But I just want to put myself on the record as just disagreeing with that aspect of it. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, okay, all right, so your hand is up and Cheryl's is up. Are you, unless you have something else to say, either of you. Unless Cheryl, Cheryl, do you have something you wanted to say? Are you ready to put it down? I just didn't put it down. My apologies. Oh, okay. okay, that's all right. All right, so I think that's it. Brian, why don't you just go ahead then, I guess, with, with the next section. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I want to say, you know, I do appreciate everyone's questions. It's one of the reasons that we present on this tonight was to hopefully provide some clarity to you all as to, you know, this process and where it is also in the, the larger land development process. So um, the questions are appreciated. Uh, we we want to make sure that you have a good understanding of everything. Um, and um, let's see with that. Uh, so the moving on to the next part of tonight, um, the objective for this part of tonight's meeting is to briefly acquaint you with some of the major topics that the comprehensive plan will provide recommendations on. And we also want to provide some time for uh, you all, the, the task force, to have a discussion on these topics um, and to provide some guidance to us in, in DPD in the county. Um, and so you'll notice uh, many of these topics can resemble some of the areas that we mentioned earlier that where we provided comments to the developers. Um, in that sense, it's kind of also your opportunity to uh, provide some feedback related to each of these areas. Um, so, you know, related to land use and design, there are uh, some of these are some examples of the questions that you know, we're asking of ourselves, of you, um, and that we try to answer in the comprehensive plan. You know, what is the appropriate mix of uses? What do we want to see here? Do we want to see uh, commercial, you know, commercial office, retail, residential, institutional, you know, for residential, is it multifamily, is it, you know, more of a traditional single family detached house in the suburbs, is it townhouses? Those are, um, when we, you know, talk about the mix of uses, that's what we're referring to. And, you know, how much of each of those, um, you know, are we, to plan for for this you know, particular site and part of that is where should they be located and i'm not talking about you know as i said earlier we create a plan we're not going to just drop a map like the concepts we've seen so far we're not just going to drop that in the comprehensive plan and says you know this building is going to be here we're talking again more in general terms so you know uh, as i had kind of mentioned you know earlier you know having more intense development nearest the metro station. So that would mean, you know, the multifamily should be closer to the metro station. That would mean, you know, offices, which should be closest to the metro station without, you know, putting a dot on the map and saying it needs to go right here. Um, you know, in terms of townhouses being located, used as a transition, you, know, you would expect to see those, if they're a transition more on the periphery of the site, again, without saying, you know, we're going to have uh, this block be, or, you know, this corner is going to be townhouse. Um, and similarly, the, uh, the plan also provides, uh, guidance on, you know, whether streets, shapes, buildings, and, uh, should incorporate pedestrian oriented design. Again, we don't actually in the plan 
get into the detail of what what is on this sidewalk what does you know um uh what is the signage here you know, all of that kind of stuff um it's language that encourages that um but again not necessarily with those details that you would expect to see in a, a zoning application um so you know before we actually before we move on to the next slide you know these kind of bigger kind of land use and design questions you know how what kind of uses are we talking about um you know where where are they appropriate on the site i don't know if there's anybody in the task force that has questions about you know again what we've seen from the development team so far if they have input if they like what they've seen if they don't like what they've seen um Paul, do you have a question right now? Your hand is up. I, I do. Okay. Uh, I, I don't, if other people have, I speak a lot. So if someone else has something before I do. Well, I, don't, I don't see another hand. So you get to go until somebody uh, decides to raise it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I, I saw what I was thinking about is that I saw Brian, you said reverse commute. You want to promote reverse commutes. So there are only three ways I can think of, and you have more experience, so you can tell me. Uh, what, whether more of that you can promote reverse commuting. One is to alter the mix so that there's less residential and uh, more business so that people are actually coming in from DC to go to work. Uh, the second I would think is by having more student housing at Virginia Tech so that the, the, the students are going to school and uh, assuming everything opens up at some point, they're going to Arlington and uh, in DC in the off hours in order to have dinner and party or whatever. I might still do that myself. Um, and, and the third is senior housing, which would be the same thing as student housing or similar to the student housing. So when you, when you said that earlier on that you want to increase the reverse commuting, I'm curious by what methods you're planning to, you, you want them to increase reverse commuting. Well, you know, a, a, for reverse commute, you know, an important part of that is an office component, which they have included uh, as as part of their proposal um, to us. Um, and so, you know, that that of course is is a major element of of encouraging reverse commuting. Right, but they they came here at some level of reverse commuting, and you want increased reverse commuting. Is that does that mean that the county wants more office space? or more retail, or what is it that the county wants above what the planners want to promote reverse commuting? I see. So I guess I, I guess I want to be perhaps a little, maybe a little more clear on some of the comments that I provided earlier, and that some of those were meant to address, um, and, and perhaps reverse commuting maybe wasn't the, the, the best term to use uh, because since that refers to a specific type of trip um, uh, some of uh, my apologies just kind of I lost my train of thought there um, you know some of we what we expect to see is you know people coming to you know use their proposed office some of it could be, to uh, come to the site for you know other uses besides office that you know is a trip not related to their job, um, so you know that that is part of the component as well, and in the comments that we provided to the development team, it's it wasn't necessarily just that you and your and the concepts that you presented to us haven't necessarily satisfied this particular requirement. It's that this is something that is important to us. And so you should make note of it. Okay, Paul, satisfied? Okay. Um, don't see any more hands. So why don't you continue, Brian? Absolutely, okay. Um, moving on. Um, uh, another, you know, component uh, of this is uh, is building height. This would be important to have a discussion on. Um, so, 
guidance related to building height can be found both in the fig this is you know in the current plan uh, the figure depicted here on the right uh, as well as in the plan text just in general um, uh, any guidance on a map and on a map like this is is more general in nature while there you know is often more specific uh, recommendations in the text so that may include uh, you know here are the maximum uh, Heights that we recommend in this map, but within that, you know, maybe we recommend a transition to, you know, to neighboring developments, or we the, we recommend what are called setbacks in height. Um, and I just want to bring this up as a reminder. This is the slide the developer showed last month that depicts the building heights uh, that they're proposing in both the WMATA and the maximum building heights they're proposing in both the WMATA and the Virginia Tech sites. Uh, as well as the planned uh, building heights in the City of Falls Church development, uh, just to the south and southwest. Um, and the recommended building heights that you saw in the figure in the previous slide, uh, we're we're expecting to increase those uh, as or recommended to increase those if if this plan moves forward from their current level to account for the FAR limits, um, the floor area ratio limits, and the board authorization and. As a reminder, that was 2.5 FAR for the Virginia Tech tract right here and 0.96 for the WMATA tract. And overall, staff is supportive of this, of this concept that uh, with, these, with these heights. Um, on the WMATA tract, the taller buildings are, are clustered uh, against the metro, um, which conforms with our transit-oriented development policy. And we, we see a transition in height down towards the village and the pavilion uh, condominiums. And it also helps to screen the parking garage, the view of the parking garage for the surrounding communities and you know, helps block uh, light from headlights uh, from coming out of that. Um, and the building heights proposed on the Virginia Tech property are appropriate given the proposed 2.5 FAR on the Virginia Tech site. Um, they're all, they also function as a transition between the more intense development in the City of Falls Church and the, and the less intense development at the WMATA tract and the pavilion and uh, village condominiums. And um, in, our, in our comments to developers, we did ask Virginia Tech to explore possibilities of step backs in height from that 135 there in that residential building uh, on the, so we asked them to explore step backs and height in the southeastern residential building uh, seen fronting Haycock Road here. Um, and as part of their response, you know, they did note that there is significant separation between that proposed Virginia Tech building and the nearest condominiums. Um, that, that that nearest wing was would be expected to, you know, they're exploring step backs and they're, they're expecting the nearest wing that they're proposing to be shorter than the maximum of 135. Um, and in any discussions about building height, I think it's important to recognize that some increase from the height, uh, some increase in height from the current plan recommendation would be needed um, to accommodate the amount of development uh, that uh, we were authorized to study. Um, so uh, it would be necessary in that sense. Uh, and taller buildings. Um, also mean that there is more open space and parks available at the ground level, which has been particularly important uh, for us on staff. We've been stressing that quite a bit. And I know that earlier on in this process, uh, you know, last year in particular, when we were talking about the existing conditions, you know, what's around here and, you know, what's missing, a lot of people were saying that, you know, there's, there's not a lot of parkland available south of I-66 um, in the county. And so, you know, it's we've taken that to heart and have, have been pushing, you know, harder for parks on the site. Um, and then finally, uh, there are ways that the impacts of building height can be mitigated through design, which I think is important to stress in, the, in any discussion on this. So, you know, I have I have two examples here of recent development in Northern Virginia, and both of these are similar to the maximum height of the what that's proposed on these tracks, you know, that 135 foot maximum. So the, the you know the tallest points of these buildings would be the tall you know, if uh, um, according to the previous slide would be the tallest points of you know 
those Virginia Tech buildings. Um, and so, as you can see, there are ways in, you know, in which the effects of building height can be mitigated. So, for example, on the photo to the left, providing some vegetation, although maybe it looks like this photo was taken in, in fall, so there's not as much, not as many leaves on the tree. Uh, but providing vegetation and some pedestrian scale streetscape um, can create a better environment for neighbors and pedestrians. And actually, uh, for this building on the left, there, uh, there are low rise condominiums and townhomes immediately across the street from, from that building. Um, it's also to keep in mind that buildings aren't necessarily, as I mentioned a minute ago, buildings aren't necessarily uniform in height on, on a single building. So you know, the picture on the right is an example of, uh, of step backs where you know, the highest point of the buildings on one end and then there are kind of tiers as it, as it moves down. Um, you know, each subsequent tier is, is a lower height. So, you know, that, that is also, you know, recommendations, those are also recommendations that can be incorporated into the, into the comprehensive plan. Um, and, you know, with that, I don't know if there, if the task force, if any members of the task force. Have uh, we, uh, Chris does. Um, Want to unmute yourself and ask? Yeah, certainly. Um, it, it's, it is, seems like it's quite a large jump up from what, what originally is in the plan to 135 foot level. Um, and if I recall correctly, the, the uh, Virginia Tech property is already sitting on a hill in the area. So does that mean that in addition to whatever hill is there, you're going to add another potential 135 feet uh, on top of that? I mean, I, I understand that you're saying it, it that there is potentially uh, a large gap between our community and the Virginia Tech, but it's really just a road. Uh, and then on all of a sudden, we're looking at now a 12 story building right next to our community. Um, the, yeah, the, the height is, is calculated from the ground level. Um, you know, again, it's not, you know, as, as depicted here, you know, we, we've asked for them to have step backs in height. Um, you know, the, the portion nearest to your community wouldn't be at that 135 feet. Um, and, you know, and, and that's not something that is uh, abnormal it's in the comprehensive plan. It's not something that's abnormal to see throughout the county. Um, you know, there's uh, actually just one of the buildings immediately across the uh, border in the city of Falls Church that they're, proposed to put, they're proposing to put next to the, uh, the high school is incorporating some step backs. Um, so what, think, what guarantees are there that the setbacks that your, your request will be honored? So, you know, like I said, we can, you know, that's, that's something that we can potentially, you know, incorporate into comprehensive. This is why I bring it up. This is, these are, these are things that can be included in the comprehensive plan. If they come in with a zoning, you know, for the zoning application that shows that, you know, a building there 135 feet all the way around and we say, well, you know, there should be a transition in height as it reaches, as it, you know, as it goes towards other buildings, you should consider step backs in height and there aren't any in a zoning application, you know, that there's, again, there, we're, the, we're looking for harmony with a comprehensive plan. That's why, um, you know, we would want to include it in, in the comprehensive plan amendment if that's something that, you know, is important. All right, thank you. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if there are any other comments. If any, if you all are interested in having, if there's any discussion, I guess on the matter. Sorry. Yeah, Bob, Paul, do you have your hand up again, or did you not take? Uh, no, I, I do. Have a, I, I just want to back up what Chris said, and I just want to concentrate on one comment. Not normal for Northern Virginia. Normal for Northern Virginia is ugly suburban sprawl. So that's uh, what we want to get you from. Uh, and I'm not saying yes or no to anything. But plopping one big thing right next to our complex like that sort of seems to me to be getting towards that ugly suburban sprawl uh, that I think we all want to avoid. Okay. Um, Paul and Chris, then I guess um, you, you're finished with your points um, and I don't see another hand up. So I guess we could keep going. Okay. Um, moving on, um, 
The comprehensive plan also contains some general guidance on connectivity. So this may describe how different properties connect with each other, what types of facilities are expected, identifies major routes through a site. Um, for example, there, there is uh, some guidance on this in the current comprehensive plan. Uh, there's a, this map here is adopted from what we have currently. It resembles uh, uh, a map in the plan that shows where major pedestrian walkways are recommended. So this is an example of something that we would expect to update in the plan with some additional, you know, potential walkways, some reconfiguring of walkways that are shown here. Um, that I would say this kind of this map that we'd have to update is probably the closest thing in the plan that has the kind of visual details that you've been seeing in the concepts that we've that we've been reviewing that have been uh, presented to us by the development team. Um, one thing I'd, I'd want to note on this, and I think it's maybe an item for discussion tonight, uh, you'll see in the current plan, it shows a pedestrian connection uh, going between the, the village and the pavilion and the new, where they're, they're proposing this new WMATA development. Um, in our comments to the developers, as I noted earlier, we noted that they should include, or at least not preclude, uh, a connection between the townhomes and the village and the pavilion if, those, if your communities are supportive. And so on that, we kind of did want to take this opportunity to hear from you about what kind of connections you would expect to see between your communities and a potential new development here. All right, Chris, you've got your hand up. Unless it's up from last time. No, it's up from last time I called. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, why don't you take, take that down if you can do it. And I'm not seeing anything. So um, I guess you're not getting a reaction right now, but. <laughs> Any, no, no one from the, the, the village or the pavilion? What, what are you actually suggesting, Brian? Because they, I don't understand, they've already, yeah. I don't live there, but uh, they've already got a connection between those communities or do they not? So I guess, you know, there's kind of the, the I guess there's that gate uh, in kind of the rear of the condos, right? That yeah, is yeah, often, I I think, perhaps unlocked that, you know, people go through, um, you know, we just, we kind of, you know, we wanted to get a sense from the community that, because, you know, like from the concepts we've seen, we've, we're showing a row of townhomes kind of uh, going to the um, uh, adjacent to the community on that side. And I guess we're just kind of getting, want to get a sense from you all, you know, what kind of connection you're expecting, what kind of connection you desire to the existing, you know, to the any potential new development there. I mean, I, I would think that you would want to maintain the existing gate that's next to the pavilion going out towards the entrance of the metro, but I don't think our community would want the fence to come down. That's what you're asking between uh, us and and the, the, the Wamata property. It's, that wasn't necessarily what I'm asking, but if there, <laughs> but if there, but I guess you know, if if there was for whatever reason, you know, uh, uh, that was the opinion of your community that you did want the fence to come down. That would of course be something that we would want to know, right? And so you know, um, we we just we just want to make sure that we gave you all the opportunity to, um, you know, to, to discuss this, to, you know, bring us your thoughts, just so that we can be aware of, you know, where, where you stand on it. I also, go ahead, I'm sorry, did you want to? No, I just, we have, we have a meeting coming up next week, um, and I think uh, EYA will be doing a presentation then, so we can certainly address it with our community. About uh, I, I think, uh, one of the issues that we see in our community is people uh, parking in our spots and cutting through and uh, going to the metro. Uh, and I, I think a concern a lot of people would have is, is that. Now, I don't know if that could perhaps be solved uh, as part of an accommodation about making that fence a gate which has a code in it such that people leaving the community get out, but people coming in, there could be ways to discourage people 
I, and I don't know what the fire or whatever rules are, but uh, I do know that it's a very attractive place for people to park who want to go to the metro. And that is something we have been dealing with intermittently for over 20 years. And I assume might uh, increase in, uh, in, in problems as it becomes a popular destination. Also, I think, you know, we've seen occasionally people liking to use the pool. Uh, we have a lifeguard there, but, you know, I could see it being something of an attraction that we don't, wouldn't see. I mean, there are other people from the villages and the pavilions here. I don't know if they agree with what I've just said. Uh, well, in fact, Linda has her hand up, so I'd like to see how, what she thinks about this. Yeah. Well, on one point, I think uh, we wouldn't want the fence down, you know, that goes around it. Uh, we've talked a little bit about adding to the berm that's back there to possibly keep out more noise, you know, and we're concerned about the landscaping that might be around, uh, you know, the fence. Uh, as far as the gates concerned, uh, it does belong to the pavilion because we you know, take care of it, we pay for it. Uh, and I don't know whether that's the best spot for the, the gate, whether we should move it at some, you know, further down, maybe closer to between the villages and us. That's something that we would probably need to hear, you know, from the developer as far as what we could, you know, do for that gate. But it is used by lots of people. You know, maybe even people from the gates or the villages and the pavilion. It's just a, you know, pretty big convenience for everybody. It's used by people who come from the metro and, and have nothing to do with any of our communities and yeah, come through to Haycock. Right. And, and David, um, just if, if I can say, you know, in my brief conversation with the EYN on this, I know that they'll probably address this at the community meeting, but. Um, I think that they have every intention if the community so desires to retain the gate, obviously, I mean, it's, it's your gate. Um, and the only question that we had was whether or not the location of the gate would line up with where the road network would be. Um, but, you know, that's open to a discussion that really, I think, gets down to the level, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, the level of detail at time of rezoning that, you know, we're not in just yet. Um, well, but, that's what I, that's what I was talking about, whether, you know, the gate should be moved or not because it right now it pretty much lines up with you know the uh just crossing the road and going straight into the metro but yeah. if there's townhouses back there you know what is you know i don't know how the route's going to look yeah you wouldn't want to be blocked i know I, I see, uh, okay i see that evan has sent a chat to everyone indicating intention is to keep the tree buffer and the fence along the gate Happy to work with the community to come up with the right spot for the gate, if not in its current location, and to come up with a lock system if folks want that. So, you know, that's why I'm sure you're keeping the gate and the fences up to your two communities than anything else. But I would think the issue would, as much as anything, just be you don't want to not have the kind of easy access once you get out of that gate that you've got now of having to go around a lot of buildings to get where you now can just cut straight through. I guess right. that's correct. Yeah, and that could be at some future date. It doesn't have to be known exactly right now, you know, so. Mm -hmm. But okay. those are kind of our concerns back there is the gate, the berm, uh, whether that, I don't know how the villages feel about the berm back there that, that and uh, the landscaping that would be put around the fence. That's it. Okay. Um, so, Paul, is your hand still up from the last time, or you have no. another comment? No, lower. Okay. So, I'm not seeing anybody new, I don't think, going, going, gone. I don't see any more takers. So, Brian, why don't you um, continue? Okay. Yeah, thank you all. That was that's really helpful input for us. Um, and then, uh, you know, finally, we... Uh, you know, expect the comprehensive plan will address some you know, environmental issues. Again, this is all very general. So, for example, requiring stormwater best management practices above the minimum requirement is, you know, something that we've seen some places in the comprehensive plan. Um, 
you know, uh, something that might be addressed is you know, buildings located adjacent to I-66. You know, we kind of can recommend, you know, sound dampening measures in site and building design um, due to the, you know, noise from the nearby interstate. Um, recommending tree preservation plans. That's those are kind of the environmental uh, 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 recommendations, general environmental recommendations that you know we can see in some places in the plan, and you know uh, are kind of topics that we might expect to address here. Um, so I guess related to that, I don't know if there are comments, questions, concerns. None. All right. And, you know, finally, I wanted to give you all a chance to discuss or ask about other topics that we haven't discussed here tonight. Just, you know, again, more general topics, or if you have recommendations for topics that should be addressed in the comprehensive plan that you think that we should consider. Um, you know, we, of course, want to hear those. Um, and I see that we're almost at nine. So uh, uh, David, sorry, I think you're muted. Sorry, you're right, I was. I'm not really seeing any other hands. Do we want to see if the um, attendees have any questions that are, or, or, or do you want to? That's, yeah, that's fine. That's the, that's the, the next, next part. Um, yeah. yeah, the next part, you know, and I, I do want to say if something's not jumping to anybody's mind right now, but they think of something tomorrow or next week or whatever. Again, you all have my email. Please feel free to email me whenever. Um, uh, and so, yeah, the next part, uh, public Q&A, opening it back up to uh, uh, members of the public. I see, Judy, you have your hand up. Um, here, you're unmuted, Judy. You can speak. First of all, um, you may remember I've been coming to all these meetings. I was on the original task force in the 70s and 80s that uh, originally designated the station uh, with the densities it has now and called it a, um, a residential station. And of course, we're moving in different directions. I, I want to also comment that the um, first person who spoke during the public uh, Q&A earlier, uh, I thought spoke beautifully and, and kind of alerted you to be cognizant of the the areas around the station. Um, my concern is, and this is a follow up on, uh, when is the right and we work with uh, to to enable the people who want to walk to the station uh, to have uh, lighting, streetscape. We were told, and it was promised during the last comprehensive plan round of many, many decades ago, that all the areas within 1,500 feet, which was considered the walking distance to the station, uh, that we would um, get good walking, good lighting, and a kind of sense of place that would go along with the station. The, the, that never happened. We had to fight for every piece of trail that we now finally have so that you can walk from the station all the way up to Haycock School, and that took decades. Who do we work with at this point to put some indication and some teeth in the comprehensive plan that says we want to encourage people to walk um, safely with good lighting not i'm all for the kids being safe in, in the surrounding areas but um we, we also want to make sure that the promises are kept and and how do we do that um thank you judy uh bob i don't know if you wanted to uh, address that at all. I think that there will be that will be a major topic of discussion at the next month's meeting. Yeah. So actually, the uh, I'm getting feedback here, but uh, what Judy, I believe it was Judy that mentioned that um, in the in the comp plan text, we'll look for recommendations on plan language to talk about 
um, bicycle, uh, sorry, pedestrian walkways and um, pathways to and from each of the three sites, as well as the uh, Wamata Station, uh, the elementary schools, but also it goes out to with walkways that uh, out to Route 7 and to Haycock Road. And in the concept plans that uh, Evans team has been presenting, they are presenting walkways and sidewalks along every building that they that they're proposing to do. So uh, the comment about lighting, that's also that we discussed in the comp plan text as a recommendation, uh, but it also be uh, recommended in uh, when they get to their zoning stage that they'll be uh, having to do that as well. So. Uh, Andrew, Andrew, you're a painter. If you want to say something else about the site plan related to um, lighting yeah. and sidewalks and such. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the I think this goes to the entire reason that, that, that the county is entertaining this comprehensive plan to begin with is to sort of set those parameters to talk about well-lit streets, talk about tree, you know, trees and streetscapes and things like that. Um, you know, the comprehensive plan will, the text that you all will be asked to be, you know, to review, and, and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but will be sort of broad scale, sort of setting those goals. And then it's up to the developer, be it EYA or, or someone else, but it's up to the developer to then implement those goals and show in great detail exactly yeah. what those lights are going to be, what the streetscapes are going to look like. Um, you know, the, the plans for the rezoning that seek to implement the, the comprehensive plan will show street sections. Uh, and the developer uh, would be held uh, just like a contract through proffers held responsible for those and development must be in substantial conformity with those proffers. So that's the promise that uh, or the promise that the developer is going to be held to. Uh, but it goes, it starts here with the comprehensive plan and sort of setting those parameters. Um, so Brian, I don't know if I've um, said too much on that. No, I think, I think that's accurate, but I do, uh, I do want to um, make sure though that uh, understanding your, your question, Judy. Uh, the so you know, and one part of what we're you know dealing with with this uh, with this comprehensive plan is right this immediate site, right? Well, the Virginia Tech and the immediate connecting properties, and that's you know, the focus of this particular you know planning study that the board has authorized us to look at is this Virginia Tech. But it sounds like you may be asking more about the area. Yes. If Am I unmuted? You are, yes. Okay, yeah, the, the situation, Andrew, I, I understand that on the, in the area that you're discussing, the comprehensive plan will clearly mark out all the these things that you're talking about. Last time, we were told that the surrounding areas within 1,500 feet from the entrance to the metro site, so across the bridge on 66, up Grove, um, I can't even remember all the streets, but there was a circle that was drawn about where they expected people to be walking from, and in fact, they do walk from, and those were supposed to be improved. They never were, and um, Brian, the interesting thing was, because of the level of development that took place with the pavilions and the villages and 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 so forth i guess there wasn't enough um to there wasn't it, they weren't big enough to ask the developers to go further but this development area is going to be so large that i would think that proffers would work better or some pressure could be put on the developments to make the surrounding area uh, easier to make it easier to reach the metro from uh, by foot um, from the surrounding areas. Okay. Um, I think that I mean, Bob, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think that will uh, is that something that you're planning on addressing at next month's meeting? At the yeah, I what what I can do is uh, we can uh, bring our bicycle and pedestrian staff, and who also work with uh, our um, sidewalk uh, staff, that they can come and talk about uh, uh, sidewalks in the in the neighborhoods in the neighborhoods. So uh, some of the uh, in general, some of the older communities uh, around the station may not have sidewalks, or they have sidewalks on one side. So. Um, 
I have a person in mind who can come and uh, talk about sidewalks and what uh, what those entail. So I'll add that to our agenda for the November discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> do, you, do you have a particular a, a particular stretch that you're that you're thinking of that really is different that way? Well, it was supposed to be to Great Fall Street, at least in that direction, because the, they put a, a dot on the entrance to the metro and then drew a, a circle of 1,500 feet, and that was supposed to be easy walking to the station. And indeed, that is where you get most of the people walking for sure. Um, I, I, I don't know how far this could go, and I don't know... I. I I'm concerned because it's very easy to say we're only rezoning that parcel around the metro, and so the rest of you, you know, forget it. You have to get those sidewalks some other way because that's we had to go to the a different section of Fairfax County to get the existing path that is along Haycock Road now, and it's only on one side. But it really was not even completed until several decades after the station. Uh, was operating. So, David, I can't tell you how far around the station it should be, but if you want to encourage people to leave their cars at home and you want to encourage them to use the metro, you want to encourage the people in the surrounding area within whatever given distance you choose to walk safely. Sure, of course. I just, I'm just having trouble thinking of a place that I know is adequate, but 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 Bob is answered. So let's see see how it plays out next time. Um, I've got. I see a question from Cheryl Sim. Go ahead. Yes, I'm sorry to take uh, some more time, but Judy's come. I just really want to reinforce Judy's comments. I have spent the last four years working with VDOT, Supervisor Faust's office and FCC, FC dot on traffic issues in our area. And I find it really disheartening to listen to a conversation where everything is focused from the current Metro entrance down to route seven. We have horrific problems up here. And I would say your studies need to go all the way to Westmoreland. So Mr. Pecora, I would ask that you please include the area of Haycock all the way to Westmoreland and even Westmoreland, because Westmoreland has become a spillover traffic route for Great Falls drivers who don't want to sit on Great Falls, and Great Falls is a spillover for Route 7. So beyond the metro and getting people to walk to metro, you're going to be adding over a thousand new residences and destinations, and we already have overtasked roads. So I know many of you are concerned about what, what this means for metro, but we're concerned for pedestrian safety, as well as a vehicle traffic. It's virtually impossible to get out of our neighborhood in the evening rush hour. So I would again just ask you to be prepared for those types of issues next November. And again, sorry for taking the floor and taking the time. No, thank you, Cheryl. Um, don't I don't see any more hands. So I don't, I don't know I, how long we want to keep that open. So, well, um, if anybody who's attending has questions uh, after the meeting, again, my email is up on the screen. Uh, the, up on the screen, um, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, I'd be happy to discuss them with you. Right. Um, and with that, uh, let's see, our next meeting is scheduled for November seventeenth at the. Normal time, the third Tuesday of the month, 7 p.m. And again, you know, we are expecting to discuss, you know, to devote that that meeting to discuss transportation issues. Um, uh, I will follow up with members of the task force, members of the public, uh, who are on our email list, uh, with the link to the meeting materials from uh, tonight's meeting. Uh, they'll be posted online on our. Uh, Meetings webpage, um, where uh, recordings from the last couple of meetings and meeting materials from the beginning are also available uh, for review. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everybody else, too.
task force members and members of the public appreciate it. I guess you can end this, Brian, whenever yeah. you... <laughs> All right, everyone have a good evening. You too.